Hey all, welcome to Circle of Tone, and today we have Appetite for Destruction with Guns N' Roses. Oh my god, the the story behind Slash's Amp is insane. It could be a lifetime movie. We have intrigue, we have espionage, theft, we have all sorts of stuff going on, and uh, there is so much information online about what you used on that album. It's insane. And then when it comes to Izzy, there's one paragraph which has gone through Google Translate, which is wrong. It's claims he used to find a basement. <laughs> Poor Izzy Stradlin gets no respect. Thank you for my patrons, the patrons of Tone. You can see their names down the bottom if you want to join that list. Keeping this uh, channel alive, just uh, check out the description. So for some of the songs, it's get more difficult to really do anything uh, because of copyright laws, things like that. So before we get into the gear, let's listen to what I got when trying to recreate what I found out that they used. Okay, here goes nothing. It's in tune. First take. It wasn't slash. So that is what I got for trying to recreate it. So let's, so first of all, let's talk about Slash. We'll talk about uh, Izzy later on, just because it's a meme, you know what I mean? So Slash, 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 Slash. Even though it really is a gestalt entity of everybody pushing and pushing in different directions, which made that band. The story of this amp is insane. A model number 39 rented amp from SIR Rentals, which is a rental place in California. This one was modded by Tim Caswell. So this modded amp was used on the rehearsals for the Appetite for Destruction, the pre-production, okay? And Slash fell in love with this amp. So he said, I want this out, I want this on the album, this is the amp, okay? So he goes away, puts a needle in his arm and gets on with his day. They give him the amp, but it wasn't the amp. They gave him a copy. And it wasn't even a, a, a copy of the actual, it was a Marshall Plexi Super Trem. Super Trem is a weird amp. I don't know what Marshall were thinking, putting tremolo on a Marshall, because it's kind of not the, the flavor of the sound. But uh, what they did is they used the extra preamp tube that was in that tremolo head, and they used that for an extra gain stage. But what they did, because they were freaking out that they would double book this amp, because this amp, was on tour at the time with George Lynch. <laughs> so they couldn't get this amp. And you know what it's like when you have record labels and everyone breathing down your neck. They So they got they they contacted this other guy to make a replica and they made it out of a slightly different amp, same type of deal-ish, and that became the SIR number 36. But there's another one, number 34, which went on to become a different amp. But we'll talk about that later. Didn't know about 34, did you? <laughs> so yeah, so uh, what what happened with this with this amp? Slash stole it. He liked it, he liked this number thirty six so much he stole it because you know he was planning on stealing the other one as well. And uh, what happened? The the guy who modded it actually went to one of their gigs and sound there was sound check going on and the rest of it. I think it was either a gig or rehearsal. I'm pretty sure it was a gig. They just went. He went straight up on stage. Went past everyone. Grabbed the head. Just put it back on the van. He had a couple of guys with him just in case. He got some, but the roadies didn't do nothing. He just took the number 36 back. And then that disappeared. 
So somebody stole that. So nobody knows where 36 is. Nobody knows where 38 is. It's bananas. Love it. Fucking, and, and that's it. What did I use? I have an old, similar year type of amp, which has two extra gain stages. So I have, it, I can't get the voice in completely the same, but it's almost, it's ballpark. I mean, the average household wouldn't have a modded vintage Marshall with an extra gain stage, and I do. So I, I think that's cool, but that's not it. Wow. This is a vintage Vox Wah. And I actually broke this one doing this doing this video, so I have another one, same year, sitting down there. For the mo half of the solos in Guns N' Roses, use a wah, and some of them use a wah half cocked. So that is where that, like, slightly push pull sound comes from. It's uh, it's also hit with uh, EQs as well, with the Pultec EQ, and also a DBX one sixty compressor. And that's what I have right there. So I don't have the Poltec EQ. I'm actually working on that. And I'm also working on a Neve uh, preamp as well. I've got one coming on on the way that uh, is going to be awesome. So lots of little ducks in a row between Slash and those speakers. What speakers do you use? I was wondering why I got so much money for these speakers when I sold them. And now I know. Not the vintage 30s that you're thinking of. These were the Celestian Vintages. I had a quad of those and they sold for silly money. So now I kind of know why. Apparently that's what you used on this album. It was like an in-between thing. Uh, it was an in-between Celestian one. They didn't make them for a very long time. So what I did, I mic'd up a... Because it bridges the gap kind of between modern speaker and old vintage, I've, I have mic'd up a modern Vintage 30 along with a old black pack. So we have the vintage black back voice and the modern vintage 30 sound. So that's what I did to get around not having the right speaker. But that is a, a huge part of the sound that I'm missing, by the way, because speakers, in my opinion, are just as important as extra gain stages and things like that. You have to get that right. Otherwise, you, you're not going to get it. But I'm still ha really happy with the results. There's a little details as well. There were some little things about Slash's guitar. Let's talk about his guitar. Slash is a ambassador for Gibson and you can buy a signature Gibson guitar but he didn't use a Gibson on Appetite for, for Destruction. Actually he did use a Gibson but it was a Gibson SG. It was only on one song <laughs> and it was a 1960 SG and he threw it out of a fucking window. Do you know how expensive a 1960s SG is? They have real path pickups in it. It's the golden year. Just one of those pickups is $8,000. He threw it out of a fucking window of a van. Because he was, would keep tuning shit. He would punch himself in the face now for doing that. <laughs> so what did he use? He actually used a Gibson copy from a local man, a local luthier. The guy who built the guitar said that he used these pickups. So there were some old pictures of, of Slash where he turns his neck pickup. I use the neck pickup, by the way. There's a rumour that he used the bridge pickup with the treble rolled down for Sweet Child of Mine. There is no fucking way that he did that that is not on the neck pickup on the album there's no way it's not a treble pickup with the tone rolled off so don't buy that shit because <laughs> i would try it you know let's let's try it versus So to me, it's obvious. Actual, you know, Seymour Duncan slash pickups, uh, even though they're regular, they are regular, they're not flipped, but they're painted to look as if they are flipped to get that uh, to the visual. So I tried my Gibson and I tried my other less Paul style guitars, but my flip pickup got that kind of violin quality. I couldn't do this on a regular neck pickup because I would lose all of the little...
So enough plugin. So that's my pickup. So yeah, so I th I'm I suspect hey, I'm, this is pure speculation, but I do think that that his Gibson copy actually had the pickup turned around on it. But that's me speculating only because I tried other ones with really good pickups in it too, really old good vintage pickups. I couldn't get that violin quality. It's hard to put my it's so stupid to, to give it these terms. So my guitar is going to sound different from the uh, Chris Derrick. Is the name of the luthier Chris Derrick? Uh, it's going to mine's going to sound different, slightly different. It's going to sound snappier because it has different fretboard material, which is brighter, uh, and also you know different pickups. I think the originals were Simo Duncan Alnico Pro Twos, but buy Simo Duncan anyway. It's a great company. Um, after you buy mine, of course. So yeah, so all the ducks in a row. We have the Chris Derrick Les Paul with Alnico Two path pickups in it from Simo Duncan. We have a an old crybaby with cocked, half cocked, not moving, just stuck in one frequency. Uh, actually, it's it's kind of pushed down quite a lot. You know, when you go back, it gets really woolly. Also, they went into the SIR, SIR modded number 36 based on the SIR 39. And that, that amp was modded by Frank Levi, or Levy, don't know how to, to pronounce it. But then there is, it goes further, if you go further down the rabbit hole, apparently Slash had four custom guitars made for him for the, in that era for that album. And he still own, owns three, apparently. So pretty cool stuff. Lots of uh, lots of intrigue. So Slash tried to steal the 39. He ended up getting a 36, which he tried to steal, which he did steal. And then because they stole that back and he lost it, the Frank Levi modded a JCM 800 for him, uh, heavily modded. And that ended up becoming the AFT 100 Marshall, his signature amp. And there's not many of those around. That sounds amazing, by the way. I tried that thing out in the, um, in the sound booth, cranked. Whew. Tried that out alongside the Ingui Malstein one. And I preferred, I loved the, the Ingui one as well, but I preferred the AFT 100. Brilliant amp, but they caught fire apparently. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, this is right up my alley. Modded marshals and, uh, you know, all sorts of shenanigans and tone tweakage and the rest of it. So how funny is that with Slash? Didn't even know what guitar he used. He actually turned up. He turned up to update for destruction with BC Rich Warlock with a BC Rich, uh, also two, two BC Rich guitars. He turned up with a Jackson. He turned up with, nobody ever mentions this. He turned up with a, what else is there? There's another weird guitar that you would never think Slash would use. Let's, let's, let's see. Is he straddling? Gibson ES-175. Which surprised me, because he said that it had P90 pickups, and he said that's the one I used on Appetite for Destruction. I think he used it on some of the songs. That is, to get one with P90s, I believe that that particular model with P90s, I think we're talking 50s. So we're talking a 1950s Gibson. So, but he used that through, drum roll. I tracked down this old interview from the producer of Guns N' Roses and he said that, you know, he's not a fan of carving amps, but it works for Izzy. And then Izzy went on to become uh, a carving endorsed artist as well. So, and he does praise Mesa. He used Mesa cabs a lot as well. And uh, so he has used both of those amps. So yeah, it's poor, poor Izzy. And the funny thing is, right, this is, this is me just speculating, okay? 
everybody's like, oh, Slash is overrated. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, Axel Rose is a megalomaniac, too, too controlling. And, uh, you know, Izzy was the heartbeat of the band. And Duff brought the punk and this and the rest of it. I believe some of those things. But what happened on Appetite for Destruction was the magic. If you would let... We all know what happened with Slash when he controls his own band, like Snake Pit, things like that. It doesn't take off to be huge because he gets too caught up on the guitar hero wankery, right? When you have Izzy, you have this stock. If you have Izzy on his own, it's kind of background music. It's good for it's good old rock and roll, soulful playing and tasteful. But when it's just him, he couldn't make it huge either because you didn't have the fire of Slash. So you've got the fire craziness of Slash. You have the basic rootsy fucking in the pocket. So you've got these two coming together. Then you have Axel pulling them left and right. And Axel is, in my opinion, which is not going to be very popular, Axel Rose was the main factor for why Appetite for Destruction was so amazing. He was the one who did the least drugs the least drinking he was actually shacked up a lot of the time with his girlfriend and his writing at the time he was really focused he was the focused one and the band were out of fucking control i have actually a theory at the time they were they were heroin uh fucking selling their gibsons they got money to buy amps and shit and slash took them and sold them you know and the only re- that's why he was going in with the dregs of his guitars with his BC Riches because nobody was wanting to buy them back then. And uh, I think the only reason that he ended up with the Kerrig Les Paul is because it wasn't sellable on the street. You know, nobody's really heard of a Gibson copy. They want the real deals. And, you know, he sold all his good Gibsons back then. So Axel was actually the focus one. And with he- Axel, with the producer, the producer said... You are not allowed to do any drugs in the studio. You can't. You have to focus. You, you know, they were drinking and things like that. But when they came into work, they actually, this producer got them, Mike Clink, got them to focus. Between, if there was no Axel, there would have been just too much chaos. And then the funny thing is, after that, when Axel renders too much control, he fucks it up because he does this overblown, overthought, over, and then he loses the punk. He loses the punk of Duff. He, he loses the, the, the drumming of Steve Alder. Which fun, speaking of Duff, Duff actually, along with Axel, I think it was. No, it was with Izzy. Izzy and Duff, they hid his drums because Adler actually is a better drummer than people think. He was all double bass, huge drum kit and the rest of it. I've seen pictures of him warming up and he's fucking good, dude. And But they were like, it's too much. They wanted to strip it back like Ramones, you know, like a, a basic kit. They were like, they had this uh, saying between them too many drums and they would steal one of his drums here and there until it was like a basic kit and then he was like kind of forced to stay in this thing but you still couldn't you could not actually take out there's like almost like a joy in his playing like a not overthinking it it's like a joyful type of bounce to his playing and the funny thing is his they you went through all sorts of uh, microphones they actually used a sm57 all over this album SM57 is the microphone when you go to tape back in the day. It was on the snare. It was on the bass drum. SM57 on the bass drum. That was the only bass drum mic. Obviously going through the Poltec and the, and the, the good shit, you know, the DBX compressors. But nobody, not many people use an SM57 on the bass drum as the only kick. How fucking amazing is that radio rock sound? And still kind of sleazy as well at the same time. It's, you know, it's... That this is how this is how they earn their money, in my opinion. This is where the real, real genius is when they all come together at the right time, right place, right frame of mind, and throw in nineteen sixty SGs out the fucking van windows, whatever it takes, right? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah, I like I used SM fifty sevens on this. I also used an old S old SM fifty sevens because I'm paranoid about shit like this. I don't use the brand new ones because you never know. You know, there's little things, there's little details. The first time I hear this album, I remember the day. It's like, you know, Kennedy getting shot. I was underage drinking. I think I was like 17. He was crashed out in his bed and I was sleeping on the floor. And he said, oh, listen to this new tape I got. It's Guns Roses, it's fucking awesome. And I was a thrash dude at the time. I was like, 
Guns N' Roses. Gay! <laughs> so I put the headphones on and it was t- I was fucking drunk and tired. So I was on the floor and I started listening to it. Imagine listening to that album. I was like, my eyes opened. Like, this is fucking amazing. And then I fell asleep listening to it. And I, I remember I remember it feeling, this is fucking awesome. I'm drunk. I had a good laugh. And then all of a sudden, I was drowning. And I was confused. And I was couldn't hit the surface. And there was something on me and I couldn't make it out. My friend had posters all over his walls. And he had a Dio poster, you know, the Holy Diver one, on his wall. It had fallen off in the middle of the night. And fallen on me when I was laying on the floor in the sleeping bag. And it was on my face. And I'd woke up with this thing resting on me. And I was like, ah! <laughs> So that was my introduction to Guns N' Roses. It was fucking hilarious. And uh, my, my, my friend was like, what the fuck is going on? And I was like, I don't know. What the-? And then you realise, you wake up. It's like, oh, nothing. <laughs> it's not the night terrors. I'm not a crazy person. So I'm sure, share your Guns N' Roses stories. You know, what impact did they have on you? And... Uh, do you have any funny stories involving tits and the rest of it? Let me know. What a band. What a band. And it had everything. They were practically homeless at the time. Fucking stories, characters, drugs, sex, rock and roll, thievery, nonsense, fucking insanity. Guns and motherfucking roses, long may they continue. And they need to realise that they need that re- original line up together and uh you know get the shit going it's it's tough when you're old and rich it's tough to get back into that mindset where you're obsessed with music where you're fucking obsessed with it when you have so many things in your attentions you know uh it's tough to get back there so uh, i don't think there'll be another guns and roses which is a shame you know oh well so i hope this i hope you like this this is fun this is a a hell of a task Let's put it that way. So let's 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 play let's play you guys out. I might be shouting because I have headphones on. And you know what it's like. <laughs> Mildred! I'm on the plane! I need to go to the toilet! <laughs> First time anyone have heard this neck pickup. I say guys uh, if you can't join us on our facebook group we if you search circle of tone in facebook we have a group that talks about you know music and you can share your own music tell us what you're doing show us your rigs you know that type of thing please subscribe please share to guns roses fans guitar fans alike 
and uh, I'll see you next time. So this was the Legend series, episode number two, Guns N' Roses. And have a good one. Circle of Tone.